I minister in many places and I often hear people say, oh, the anointing was so special this morning in worship or the anointing was tangible when we uh, started to read from this scripture. The anointing was so great when you prayed. Then I think maybe we are confusing the anointing with the presence of God. Anointing was a very, very practical thing in Scripture. Anointing has to do with a shepherd that wants to protect its sheep, that wants to make sure that its sheep are not harmed. Anointing is not about the presence, but anointing is about making something separate for a specific purpose. Anointing is making something sealed off so that the enemy can't come in. If you remember what a shepherd does for its sheep, you know that a shepherd will always try to protect its sheep. So anointing comes from a shepherd that takes some oil from maybe some olives and puts it on the ears of his sheep and makes sure that no bugs or things can come in to make his sheep sick. So anointing is a very practical thing. And I want to speak to you about anointing and how we should be treating anointing rather than confusing it with the presence of God. But let's go to a place where it is very, very, very relevant. So we're speaking about anointing. Why then come to the desert? Well, this is a very specific desert. Before I tell you about it, I want to mention about anointing. Kings were anointed, priests were anointed, you had prophets who were anointed, even the dwelling place of God, the tabernacle, was anointed. The temple later was anointed. So anointing is something special. Anointing is something holy. Anointing is saying, this is now belonging to God. The enemy cannot come into this thing. We are now free from the enemy if we are anointed. So why this desert? This is the desert of Ein Gedi. And we know that this is the place where David flees from Saul. Saul had a uh, a few challenges in his life. The Philistines were one of them and David was another. So David flees to Ein Gedi and we read in the Bible that Saul then hears this is the place where David flees and Saul decides I'm going to go get David and he arrives in this place searching for him and he goes into a cave to sleep and Saul then sleeps the evening and David is there and David's men says, God has given Saul into your hands. You can now go kill Saul. But what does David do? He goes silently in the evening up to Saul while Saul is sleeping and he cuts off the hem, the corner of Saul's garment. And then we see the next day, David shows this to Saul saying that, I could have killed you, but I didn't. And there's a lot, long teaching about why David cut off that little corner. And if you want to hear about that, you can come tour with us. But I want to speak about why did David not kill Saul? So there's a Hebrew word, Meshuach, or Mashuach, perhaps. This word means to be anointed. Now David, he was certainly anointed. We know he was anointed by Samuel, anointed to be the king of Israel. So David was anointed to be king, but before him, Saul was also anointed to be king. And there's a great reason why David did not kill Saul. because David has this belief that God has given to him not to touch the anointed of God. And it's strange because we think, okay, David was anointed, so it replaces the anointing of Saul. But no, 
David says, I will still, even though I am the new king, the one who will be, I will still not touch the anointed of God. David is very patient. David waits on his turn, waits on the time that God has for him. It's really, really a special understanding that David has not to touch the anointed. Was Saul the greatest king? Was Saul in the right place that David could kill him? Saul was not a great king. David could kill him. But David had this decision in his heart to say, I will not touch the anointed of God because I am also anointed. And this is actually kind of a thing of what you sow, you will reap. David is saying, I want to be an anointed that will also not be touched. But you see in the Psalms and you see also in the story, David stands on this belief of his firmly saying, I will not touch the anointed of God, even if he's not the greatest, even if he doesn't have the protection of God anymore. So why is this relevant to us? Well, I think we all somehow know we have a calling. We know God has something for us. And we have people around us who are leaders, people around us who are anointed for certain reasons. But we don't often respect them. We don't often honor them because we feel they are not doing things the way we would have wanted them to do it. Maybe you have a leader in your community, a leader in your congregation, a pastor or someone, and you feel, yeah, they're anointed by God, but they're not making decisions the way I would have done it. Still, you should not touch them. Still, you should not be gossiping about them behind their back, speaking badly about them. You should actually be protecting them. Even though God has given a new person an anointing, even though you are perhaps the next leader, you should still honor the anointing, that mashuach that God has on someone. When you do this, there is blessing. There is blessing because you waited patiently for the right time, for the time that God had and not the time that you wanted things to happen. We see so often people in this world want things to happen on their time and not on the time of God, and then they fail. But when you wait for the right time, when you patiently wait for the right time that God has appointed, you will see great blessing. In Israel, when you visit here, one of the first words you learn is savlanut. Savlanut is the Hebrew word for patience. And you really need to be patient when you are walking around in this country, the way people do things here in this nation. But savlanut goes a long way. Savlanut goes a long way, not only in Israel, but also in the kingdom of God. When you wait patiently for your turn, when you wait patiently for that anointing, you will experience that great blessing that God has for you.